My parents always warned me to lock the door behind me, especially when getting home late. I was home alone that night. My parents and sister were going to be out of town on a camping trip. I was 13 years old and thought I was too cool to be camping and eating s'mores with my family. It was going to be a three-day weekend, meaning I would be home alone until Monday night. My parents left me some pizza money and allowed me to have a couple of friends over. My friends came over. We ordered some pizza, played some video games, and finished the night by watching Insidious. My friends decided against spending the night because they had to be up early the next morning. My friends had plans with their families. I tried to convince myself that being home alone would be fun. I'd be able to do anything I wanted without worrying about getting in trouble. I could stay up late, eat junk all day, and play as many video games as I desired. It was midnight and I began to drift off halfway through Sinister when a thump woke me up. I didn't know where it was coming from, but it was loud enough to wake me up. I told myself I could defend myself if anything were to happen. I was a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu after all. I heard another thump and then I heard steps. It was coming from above me, which is my bedroom. Every bit of courage I had slowly left my body. I started to cry out of fear, but as the man of the house, I had to be tough. I armed myself with the fireplace poker and walked upstairs to my room. Each step made my heart beat faster. I could hear every beat in my ears. I turned on every light in my house on my way to my room. I burst the door open to my room and turned on every light. I opened my closet, checked under my desk, and behind my door. It was all clear. I figured it was my brain playing tricks on me. I decided to go to bed. After the adrenaline dump had left my body, I was exhausted. I laid on my stomach with my arm dangling off my bed. It was the most comfortable position for me to sleep. I woke up a couple hours later to the feeling of someone touching my arm. Before I could look, it stopped. As I was closing my eyes again, I felt a strong grip grab my wrist and pull me with such force that it almost dislocated my shoulder. I let out a scream and jolted out of bed and grabbed the baseball bat leaning against my desk. I whimpered and shook in the corner of my room. Out from under my bed rolled out a tall, stocky man. I asked him what he was doing in my room. He let out a bone-chilling laugh and smiled. He started walking towards me in this slow, threatening pace. I reacted quickly by hitting him on the side of the head with my bat. He hit the floor fast. He was unconscious. I ran out of my house as fast as I've ever ran before. When I got to the front door, I realized that I forgot to lock the door when my friends left. I was hating myself for forgetting to lock the door and for forgetting to look under my bed. I ran over to my neighbor's house and had them call the police. I looked out my neighbor's window and could see the man standing at my bedroom window. I could see the man standing there, looking out of my window, looking for me. My neighbor walked over to me and let me know the police were on their way. The police searched my entire house and they didn't find anything. They assumed he snuck in while I was asleep on the couch. My parents ended their camping trip early and came home to make sure I was safe. We never heard anything back from the police or ever saw this man again. My dad put up security cameras and automatic locks on the doors, but that only made me feel slightly safer. This happened some years ago. I was 20, I think. I was going on a road trip with a really good friend of mine and his family. Our destination was a concert in a country next to ours, but we would be stopping at night to sleep in the camper we drove in. We didn't cross the border yet when we stopped at the first campsite for the night. Now it seemed like a pretty family friendly and safe place, so none of us had our guards up or anything. That night at about 11 p.m. or so, while my friend and his family were getting ready for bed, I went outside to get some fresh air. Our camper was almost completely next to the beach, so I went down to the shore to dip my feet and get some much needed quiet time by myself. On the way there, I passed by a beach shack, a detail that will be important later. As I stood there, letting the waves lap over my feet, I noticed the silhouette of a man further down the beach, but it was a public space for campers, so I didn't think much of it. After being absorbed by splashing in the water with my feet and enjoying the moonlight, 
I decided to make my way back. Of course, it was very dark given the late hour, but I don't scare easily. Now, as a woman in the modern world, I usually do stay on my guard after dark, but that thought never occurred to me since I felt I was in a safe environment so close to the campsite. As I was walking back, I noticed that the silhouette of the man further down the beach was gone. But even more worrying was the fact that I was nearing the beach shack. I saw that someone seemed to be trying to hide from behind it. Immediately, I was on alert and called a friend I knew would be awake. I gave the shack a wide berth while talking loudly to my friend about how she was coming to meet me. Not too long after, I got safely back to the campsite and hopped in bed in the caravan. I didn't tell my friend or his family because even though I was scared, there could have been many logical non-threatening answers to what I saw. I put it out of my mind and the rest of the trip went off without a hitch. About a year or so later, I was talking to my friend about the trip and suddenly remembered the creepy experience. As I told him, he slowly got pale though and told me something his brother had told him and his family over breakfast some months after the trip. That same night, after I had gotten back and gone to bed, his brother had gotten up late at night to get some water, but when he passed the window right by his bed, he saw a man standing outside looking in through the window. As soon as he was caught, the man left, but it definitely creeped out the brother a lot, but just like that, he seemed to put it out of his mind. Now with both of these stories, it doesn't seem far-fetched that the man hiding by the beach shack had followed me back. I really am scared to think about what would have happened if I had been alone. This happened several years ago. I was home alone one evening when I heard a knock at the back door. This confused me, as no one ever used that door. My husband and I lived in a fourplex at the time and all of the units had a back door at the top of a narrow staircase. These doors were a little inconvenient to access as you'd have to go around the building and up the narrow stairs as opposed to the wider main entrance at the front. It didn't make sense to use the back entrance and I couldn't think of anyone who would go to that door to visit. As I approached the back door, I saw two tall men in the window standing at the door a chill went down my spine. I did not feel safe opening the door, so I called out, Hello? One of the men tapped on the window. Yes, hello. May we come in? We are with Branson. At the time, my husband and I had Branson for cable, but did not have any issues with it. I replied, We're not having any issues with Branson. Is there a problem? Ma'am, the man said. Can we come in? We're servicing the area, and it's important we look at your cable. I shook my head. We're not having any issues, I repeated, so there's no need to stop by. Ma'am, we are visiting every resident. Let us in so we can do our job. I noticed the man grabbed the doorknob and tried to open the locked door. I slowly grabbed a knife from our knife block and held it at my chest. We're not having any issues, I repeated, trying not to convey shakiness of my voice. So you don't need to be here. Two figures appear to shuffle and then straighten. Ma'am, let us in. We're on a deadline, and we need to do our job. I glance at the clock, gauging when my husband would arrive home from work. I gripped the knife tighter. Ma'am? I saw him try the doorknob again. I closed my eyes and felt overwhelming gratitude of always locking my doors. Just then, a thought came to the forefront of my mind. I'm sorry I can't tell you. Could I please get your names and badge numbers? I can give your supervisor a call to let them know our cable is fine. I heard another shuffle, and one of the men replied, No need to, ma'am. We're sorry for wasting your time. With that, both of the men exited the staircase and disappeared into the night. Shaken up, I held the knife tight and tried to get my bearings. I remember making a mental note to call the cable company or the police, but my hands were shaking so badly. I couldn't hold my phone. With a knife still grasped to my chest and the phone falling out of my other hand, I sank to the floor and cried. When my husband returned home, I told him what had happened. I was still very shaken up and had started crying again after he came home. 
He immediately called the Branson Cable Company and spoke to a representative, who informed us that no one from their company was out on assignment in our area. The next day, we asked our neighbors if they had a visit from the company. No one had. So to the two creepy men who tried to break into my home under the disguise of cable repairmen, let's not meet again.